Good afternoon, you guys. So we are presenting on the Spiral of Silence, and my name is Gabe. My name is Sindhu. Jared. Sean. Tasia. Grahill. All right, so jumping into our agenda for this afternoon. Simply put, what is the Spiral of Silence? Well, the Spiral of Silence kind of explains why majority opinions tend to speak out in the majority, or minority opinions tend to not speak out in their opinions because they feel like they're a minority opinion. Um, and that's based on the fear of isolation. So the minority opinions won't speak out based on fear of isolation. Uh, after that, we'll be jumping into uh, why is understanding the spiral of silence important? Um, from a business standpoint, understanding the spiral of silence is going to help you guys based on um, avoiding groupthink. So we're simply creating an awareness for you guys so you can apply that in the business world um, and understand that your opinions don't need to fit into the majority at all times. Um, after that, we're going to be, I'll be passing it off to Jared, who's going to be explaining more of the uh, motivations as well as jumping into a case from Enron. Uh, following that, I'm going to pass it off to Sean, or Jared's going to pass it off to Sean, who's going to be uh, explaining more in depth the spiral of silence. Following that, um, Tasia's going to be covering some whistleblower cases as well as uh, some more business applications for you guys. Uh, directly following that, Cindy is going to be covering some more applications as well as some literature uh, based on the spiral of silence. And then Rahil is going to conclude for us at the end. So we do have a two-part activity for y'all. Um, the first part, I'm going to preface this a little bit for y'all. Um, I want you guys to understand that this is a safe space. I'm going to ask two controversial questions, and you don't have to answer whatsoever. I'm going to say that again. Again, you don't have to answer. So, the first question is, it's open to interpretation, but we're not going to explain on our end. Do you think the U.S. should have open borders? If so, raise your hand. And again, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. So that's two. Do you think the U.S. should have closed borders? Raise your hand. Three. Okay. All right, the second question is going to be a little bit more controversial than that one. And again, you don't have to answer. Are you pro-life? Raise your hand. Four. Four. Are you pro-choice? Raise your hand. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you guys. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Jared. Um, we'll jump into those answers a little bit more towards the end when we jump into the second part of the activity. All right, so Jared. Um, so I'm going to go in a bit more in depth in the spiral of silence. I'm going to start out with uh, Noel Newman's uh, original five hypotheses. Um, so the first is that people tend to um, create an image of the distribution of opinions. Um, on topics, and then the second is that they're more likely to um, share their opinions if they think they're in the majority. And then on this, I have as the third, but it's really the fifth. Uh, I just put it there because it would be more convenient to explain. Is that they're also taking into account like the momentum of the opinion, and so if they think it will be more popular in the future, then they will be more willing to share it. Um, then we move on to the fourth. Um, so there. Um, if you, if you have a vocal group, they are more willing, um, then your distribution is going to be skewed because you're going to be thinking that um, they're larger than they actually are when in reality they're just um, saying it a lot. Um, and so that's going to skew the imagined distribution. And then lastly, uh, opinions tend to have momentum, so if it's popular now, then it tends to be popular in the future. Um, and so moving on to the surveys. So she conducted a few surveys for this. And so she would ask opinions on controversial topics, um, ask people what they thought, other people thought about those topics. And then lastly, she would ask, um, well not lastly, there were more questions, but she would also ask if, um, there, uh, if they were, uh, if they heard a conversation about this, would they join in? So whether or not um, they were affected, or yeah, they were affected by the spiral of silence. And um, she, one of the interesting conclusions was that sometimes these opinions get like chiseled down into their um, most hardcore supporters, 
And so that's a case where these tribal styles doesn't really work because the only people left really believe in what they um, think, and so they're more willing to share that opinion. I'm going to move on to um, a quick topic. We'll have more, or a quick example. We'll have more examples later, um, which is Enron. And so one of the things we wanted to bring to your attention is why this should be important to you and how groupthink might affect you. You know, you might think that like if I just do what's right and keep my head down and do my work, then whatever other people are doing wrong won't really affect me. But uh, since Enron went out of business, everybody who worked there lost their jobs, and they were all heavily invested in their 401ks, and their stock went to zero. So even though uh, plenty of the employees didn't do anything wrong, uh, they still lost money and lost their jobs. So it's uh, a very important topic, even if you do what's right. So now I'm going to hand it off to Sean. All right, so um, in a study done by German Neubaum and uh, Nicole Kramer uh, titled, What Do We Fear? Um, they went over the motivations and um, some of the reasonings behind why people will essentially gag their uh, opinions in social situations. Um, some of them are, uh, the two main ones that they went into were fear of isolation, which was mentioned earlier, and then sanctions, which is kind of an umbrella term for things like fear of judgment, um, which I have as a list of uh, different fears in that judgment category, as well as verbal or physical retaliation. Um, one of their biggest factors that they noted was anonymity in situations. Um, so to give an example, um, somebody speaking to a group of strangers may be highly likely to speak an unpopular opinion because they don't care what they think of them because they're not going to see them again. But if I talk to my best friends, for example, and I speak to an opinion that they don't think is in the majority or not okay with them, they're a lot more likely to judge me and I'm a lot more likely to perceive that as something that I would fear happening. Um, this kind of also goes into the individual as well. If you're in a group where you're highly identifiable, that um, causes you to be much less likely to uh, voice those opinions. Um, and this uh, anonymity also goes to people who are constantly judging themselves against the situation, um, making sure that they know whether or not their opinion, if they were to voice it, would bring these sanctions, and so people are always um, working on like figuring out how they sit in, this, in the environment that they're in. Um, going off more on what German and uh, Nicole went through, um, they did a study involving the online and offline differences. And something that was very interesting was that they found that people in offline scenarios are slightly more likely to present their opinions, citing that people can backtrack, mitigate opinions, and keep it all in the same context. And people find, or, and they found that through that, um, people were less afraid of the sanctions when they could attack the sanctions or mitigate their effect on them. Um, conversely, in online scenarios, people are less likely to do so um, because of the fact that with um, how everybody says that on, online it's always on there, the second you put it out there, people usually are afraid to put something out there that somebody could come ba bring back from the past and use against them and take it out of the context that it was originally put, put in. Um, this usually um, kind of manifests itself in kind of like chat rooms or like on Facebook, people won't put something that they don't feel uh, rhymes with the uh, overall uh, group. And now I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Tasia who's gonna go more in depth on uh, real world examples like that. All right, so a spiral of silence, it's kind of a subconscious thing. A lot of times we don't even realize we're doing it. So how do you break the spiral of silence? Um, an example of when someone has broken the spiral of silence is in whistleblowers in business. So there are four elements to someone whistleblowing on their company. The first is the trigger. So what about the situation makes the person say, this is wrong, um, I'm going to say something about it. And the second one is the personal attributes or traits of the whistleblower. So how far are they willing to go with it? Who are they going to talk to? Um, how determined are they, are, are they to bring this issue to light? And then after that, there is the constraints of the company. So maybe like any contracts that the whistleblower has signed that may keep them from speaking out about something. Um, just any infrastructure laid down to prevent someone from um, bringing any issues to light. So the last is the consequences, which is basically like what gun comes of it, um, how, how well the person is able to make a difference in the organization and the people who are affected by it. So, um, Two examples of whistleblowers that one was touched on, Shannon Watkins earlier of Enron, and then Cynthia Cooper is another pretty big whistleblower. 
she was an accountant at WorldCom, <clears throat> and um, she noticed little discrepancies in taxes that the company was having. So she, with her team of other accountants, worked super secretly late at night to uncover $3.8 billion of fraud at WorldCom. So um, those are two examples. And the last one in the middle is an actually whistleblower from the FBI, and the three of them were named Times Persons of the Year for that year, which is pretty big. So I'll pass it off to Sindhu, who will talk about the literature aspects. So we've kind of talked about how the spiral of silence started and where you know those initial questions and surveys came from. But obviously since then, there's been a lot more research done on this particular communication theory. And a lot of it brings up, brings up some really interesting points about what might drive the spiral of silence. We did talk about those motivations, but those all of those motivations that we've talked about thus far have been centered around the American and and Western world, and but interestingly, what we find is that the spiral of silence holds through pretty much anywhere in the world. So anywhere in the world, this phenomenon is true, but the reasons that are behind it tend to differ. And why that's so important is the only way that we can get you know more whistleblowers or more people to kind of voice their opinions is to know why they're not saying. If they're all hiding them for different reasons, a singular tactic isn't going to help break this in communication pattern. And so because of the cultural context, one of the most impactful kind of articles that we were able to find were, was one by Professor Hong looking at the differences in the spiral of silence between Taiwan and the USA. Taiwan being a very, very collective society, they place a hole over the individual pretty much all the time. To them, the goal of the society is more important than their personal goals. Whereas the US, we come from a very individualistic society where everyone is going to you know, try to improve their own personal goals. Their aims is to make sure that they're reaching their own personal goals. They don't really care as much about how the society around them is doing. So this individualism versus collectivism actually changes how people are going to voice their opinions. If you're in a collective society, you the reason that you might not actually you know come out with your opinion isn't necessarily because you fear being isolated. It's actually just the fact that you don't think it should be done. Like you don't think it's right. You maybe you know that you can voice your opinion and no one's going to you know treat you any differently because of it, but it would still disrupt overall harmony and you don't want that to happen because it's been so ingrained in you to make sure that societal harmony is maintained and preserved. Whereas in an individualistic society, the reason that you're not speaking out is because you just don't think you can do much about it. This holds true in pretty much both societies, but it's a lot more prominent in the US where you're like, this doesn't affect me. I just don't really care enough about it to say anything. So the actual lack of efficiency and the inability to do anything is a big part, but it plays a much bigger part in the US. A kind of an interesting find in uh, this article was also the fact that in neither of these societies was fear of isolation actually apparent through the surveys, even though that has always prominently been said to be one of those driving factors. So this is kind of something that's recently kind of come up as a point of contention. Are we actually afraid of isolation or do we just not care or do we not think it's important enough or you know what are these other underlying reasons that we might not actually be voicing our opinions and so obviously collectivism versus uh, individualism makes a huge difference in how we are going to go about convincing people that it is worth it to speak out and kind of to pass it on and take a little bit more of an in-depth look at the spiral of silence, we have our second part of the activity. So I just want to thank you guys for participating in the first part of the activity. Uh, now that we have a better understanding of the spiral of silence, like I mentioned before, it's essentially along the lines of majority opinions don't express, or majority opinions express their opinions because they feel like they're in the majority. They don't have that fear of isolation. Minority opinions don't necessarily express their opinions because they have that fear of isolation. But as mentioned earlier, you can break the spiral of silence theory, and you see how it flips the majority, the minority opinion again becomes the majority, and then it flips again, and it's just like a spiral. 
<clears throat> so anyways, jumping into the activity, um, we're going to ask you guys again two questions. So if you have your cellular devices, go ahead and pull those out. And if you don't mind punching in that code, um, you don't have to use your names. And again, this is completely anonymous. I can't even see what you're putting down. So definitely you, you can use any name that you want to. It does not have to be. And the results are anonymous as well, um, just to make that, that crystal clear. class. So once we get upwards of that number, then we'll go ahead and get started. 2025. Give it a couple more seconds before we hit go. Exactly. So should the U.S. borders be open, closed, or do you not want to answer? And again, I can't see your answers. No one up here can see your answers. It's all anonymous. And there's no right or wrong answer either. Per life, per choice, or decline to answer? So what you're soon to find out is that, like we mentioned earlier, um, having that online versus offline presence. We can't see what you're putting, so the answers are going to be a little bit different than what we took at the beginning before we had primed you on what the spiral isosceles theory is. Uh, so, so we're excited to share those results with you. Okay. So taking a really quick look at the results, obviously we had only about five people answer that initial question of whether the U.S. border should be open or closed. This is a question that has a direct impact on us, but isn't something that any of us in this room can do too much about. So speaking of the spiral of silence, this is supposed to make people more apathetic. They don't really care enough to voice their opinion, which was accurate compared to the second question, which is pro-life versus pro-choice, which has a lot more immediate bearing on most of our lives and most of our futures. And obviously we see five people respond to the first question versus the 14 on the second one. Looking at the anonymous results, this held true. But instead of having five people respond, we had about 
18 respond and six choose to not. And, the, and we have a split of about six and 12. So the ratio is about, you know, it's still about the same. We still have more people that think we shouldn't have closed board or we should have closed borders. But people are a lot more willing to speak out, even though this isn't necessarily something that is close to what we believe, right? The more interesting question was the second one, pro-life versus pro-choice. We had about 14 people respond initially, which means this is something that we care about. More people are willing to voice their opinion. But when we put it up on Kahoot, because of that anonymity, we have, instead of having a four to 10 split of pro-life to pro-choice, we have a 10 to 11 split. It gets a lot closer. Being that we are in a very, you know, we're on a college campus, we're expected to be in a much more liberal environment, a lot of people who are pro-life chose to not speak out when asked that initial question because they didn't want to be seen as, you know, the minority. And that has been, you know, and, but when you have that ability to be anonymous, immediately people are a lot more willing to actually share their opinions. And that's exactly what we were talking about kind of through this presentation. And the fact that maybe you might not be in the minority as because you weren't in this room, it was almost a 50-50. But when it comes to you know, actually saying your perceived notion of what your environment is, causes you to not speak out. And because of that level of interest, of that level of involvement we do have, there was only about three people who said they declined the answer. So I guess that should give you a really good example of how the spiral of silence does affect us on a day-to-day -day basis and the conversations you may choose to have with coworkers, managers, peers, and anyone else. So kind of moving on to Raquel to conclude. Uh, so for conclusion, that was our activity that we did, a little two-parter. So when we're doing the activity, you could see that there was good results. People didn't want to speak up because they were afraid to voice their opinions because they saw that these are really controversial questions and they don't want to be judged. So one of the reasons this happens is because it's fear of isolation and sanctions. If you say something that's controversial, but you don't think that you're in the, mi if you think you're in the minority, not the majority, you're afraid that people won't look at you the same way, people won't judge you, people won't talk to you the same way they do, you won't be part of the group anymore, so to say. So people are afraid to say that, but when it's anonymous, people are more willing to say what they actually feel like, which is what we're trying to get to. Next, we have sanctions. People are also afraid of sanctions. Like when someone uh, wants to say a minority opinion, but they're afraid they'll get uh, discriminated against, or they feel fear for physical retali uh, retaliation or emotional retaliation. Like you can't, like in China, you can't really speak out against the government that much. So that's like a fear of sanction right there. But even with those two major uh, factors that contribute to spiral of silence, we have people that aren't afraid to voice their opinions. Some of them are whistleblowers. They come out, they're not afraid, or they get over their uh, fear of isolation or fear of sanctions, and they decide to speak the truth or speak whatever their opinions are. So you can see these kind of people being everywhere. Like even during our uh, uh, activity, we still had a couple of people. We had five people for the first question, then 14 people for the second question. People weren't afraid to voice their opinions. They weren't afraid of being isolated or they weren't afraid of having sanctions. They were confident that they do believe in their opinions and it doesn't matter what other people think of them. So that's our presentation here. Uh, these are the few things that Spiral Science has. As long as you pay attention to what happens in your environment, you can see this being applied anywhere, from business meetings to casual hangouts with friends. Even your family, you could be experiencing this. We can be even experience it in this classroom. So that's it for our presentation. We'll be taking any questions now. Thank you. Yes, Melissa. Okay, so you said uh, it's they're kind of unsure what causes it depends on the culture. Sometimes it's you don't want to be ostracized with the group. Sometimes you just don't care enough. Is uh, in your research did you figure out why that's still considered this one theory instead of different theories? Because normally if they have different causes, they become different theories. And so I guess the primary reason behind that is there's still a lot of commonalities. A lot of the same things are making a difference, and a lot of the same things are not making a difference, but it's rather which one's having a stronger effect. So they're not necessarily completely separate from each other, it's just that one might be more of a driving cause in one culture and the other in a different culture. Yes? Would you say it's like similar, like when they take a poll pr prior to an election and the actual election is completely different or not the same? 
Well, yes, that's also correct, but there's two different type of polls sometimes. There's polls that happen at rallies and stuff, and there's polls that happen online. So sometimes you can see that there's actually differences in those two. But the election thing is the same. Like, in our election for uh, 2016, uh, yes, thank you, uh, we saw that Hillary was going to win according to the polls, but when it actually came to the election, Donald Trump actually won. That was because people were afraid that you don't want to come out in a conservative rally and say Hillary all the way because uh, you're afraid of the physical sanctions that you might have against you. <laughs> so these are things that happen. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, in your research, did you find like any common drivers for whistleblowers? I mean, obviously there's been more controversial whistleblowers in the past, say, with this and on WorldCom. But were there any commonalities between like the ones I looked into? Usually it was like their feeling of ethics, their morality, what they feel like. If they believe that uh, the company was doing something wrong or um, illegal, they want to come out and uh, expose them because that's not how we're supposed to live our lives. And um, you guys have anything else to add to that? I guess the more interesting part of it was money often isn't a driving factor just because most whistleblowers don't actually get too much money out of it. They, um, you know, a lot of times whistleblowers do lose just because they don't have the financial backing to get those lawyers and stuff. So money is not a driving factor. Was an interesting. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's really is, it just comes down to your personal morality and ethics. That's the driving cause between what makes whistleblowers make the decisions that they do. Other questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.